Are there any announcements anyone has? Uh, I don't have any. Um, we're just going to uh, then move on into the uh, next talk. We're happy to have uh, Professor Mike Schatz from Georgia Tech. Uh, to talk, talk to us about scientific writing. Okay. Take it away, Mike. Thanks, Mark. Um, actually, I'll take this opportunity to do to make some announcements. So uh, st this afternoon and then for the next two afternoons, we'll be having our sessions on professional development. Um, and toward that end, we make assignments of, of people in this room map to session leaders on particular uh, topics associated with communication. So for today, these are the assignments. So you should look up here and see if you find your name. Okay, I have one that, would not, that you don't see your name. Okay, so we'll, we'll fix that. But you should find your name and if you don't see it here, see me and I will make an assignment after, uh, after my talk. Okay, but it's important uh, because this is how in preparation, how, how you, each of you submitted a poster. Um, we're gonna start this afternoon. Uh, in tutorial sessions where you will get in small groups with your peers and a session leader and work on your poster, snapshot, or writing. So everyone has submitted some material that is a poster in electronic form and that's the basis on which all these elements will be, uh, will be uh, discussed. Okay. So look for your name here, and I'll, then at the end of the talk, I'll go over and just uh, point out whether you're, st again, we're gonna be, some of you stay here, some of us will go up the hill to the M Lab, but focusing on these uh, communication uh, tutorials. Any questions about this? How many other people don't see their name up here? Do not see your name up here. Okay, so we just have one person, okay. Okay, so I am not uh, Harry Swinney. However, the um, sl slides I'm going to present today are, have been put together. It was a talk based on a talk delivered by Professor Harry Swinney, who is one of the founders, the founding directors of these hands-on schools, uh, and as well has been the advisor and mentor to uh, many of the session leaders. And so uh, uh, he has, through the years, uh, in addition to being an outstanding scientist, he is, uh, in my view, and I'm sure a number of the session leaders who know him, one of the uh, best communicators of science, in particular of, of written science, of scientific communication and writing that we know of. So he has put together a series of tips, and I'm going to step through that and uh, point out some of the things that I learned from, from Harry when I was his student. And, uh, it's really a good advice about writing. The first thing that I want to point out is that there's no one way of communicating, writing papers, uh, write, writing any for, form of communication is as much art as science, okay? And there are several paths to being effective at communicating. That said, there are some uh, tried and true methods um, each of us, when we read a paper or listen to a scientific communication, we have a sense of whether that was effective, whether we've learned something, okay? When we're on the other side and producing that product, you know, writing the paper, it's so sometimes harder for us to kind of see, well, what is it about that, that uh, communication, the, let's say, writing a scientific paper, which makes it effective. And we're going to go through some of those ideas based on uh, tips that Harry has put together through the years, okay? So first, let's talk about the issue of writing. And um, this won't advance here. And let's, let's say you have put published an article, you put it in a scientific journal that's pretty well known, one of the scientific journals of a, a professional society, or one of the well-known commercial publication, uh, publishers, commercial publishers. Um, what happens to that article? So this is information, this is a, a information that has been gleaned based on 
when people are searching for papers online or they are starting to read a paper. So it's based on what's called clickstream, uh, the kind of online interactions with various ways in which we access publications. Okay? And basically, the numbers, roughly speaking, fall as, uh, fall as follows. That within five years of uh, publishing an uh, article, typically, um, through some search or some uh, keyword search, that there are ordered 10 to the 4, 10,000 researchers who actually access that article. And you know, either getting the keyword or have done a title search and, and, and have brought up Let's say it's your paper published in a, in a well-known journal. It's been out there for five years. There's a border 10,000 hits along those lines. And that's a pretty large number, okay? But that doesn't mean that they have actually read your paper, right? So of those 10,000, probably about 10% or so actually make the next step. They look at this, this result of that search and they say, okay, let me see if this is something I want to continue reading. So they access or read part of the abstract, right? Now, that doesn't mean you actually read the paper. There's the next level down. Of that, those number of people, probably of order uh, 100 or so, will actually read some aspect of your paper, not necessarily cover to cover, but actually will go next level down. And from there, if, we're, if, if you're fortunate, right, you're gonna get some, something of order 10 citations um, for the paper. Now, what is it about this process, right? This is a lot of uh, winnowing down that happens. Um, and you know, the basic fact of the matter is, is that People who are reading a paper will find plenty, uh, or who start down this trail, will find plenty of reasons for not continuing to delve more deeply into that paper, right? And I would say the main point of this talk is to try to design your scientific paper in such a way that you don't give the person who's, who is going down this path a reason to stop reading. Right? That is, you have to try to think of ways in which you can perhaps boost this number of people that, that you, you work very hard on your scientific research, you think it's great stuff, and you want other people to read it. That piece, that bridge between your work and you're trying to get that word about that work out there is a very crucial step, a bridge, and there are ways in which, you know, basically when the reader's going through this, it, there may be things in the paper that just cause them to stop reading. Nothing you, some things you have no control over, but there are things that we want to make sure we go through and try to make sure that we are not the, the barrier. We don't put up obstacles to the reader such that they will stop at some point and don't proceed further and don't, uh, don't actually read our scientific research. So that's the key idea is we don't want to try to find ways to avoid giving the reader reasons to stop reading. Okay? Now, so let's start with uh, looking at uh, the paper title. Okay, so this is among the first things that, that uh, a reader will, will look at. What are some key ideas uh, first of all, be descriptive, right? So you are you have a um, you have a particular scientific topic. You want to make sure you carefully think about your title in a way which communicates uh, accurately the science that you're trying to convey, but at the same time doesn't obscure it. Okay, what are ways that you can obscure it? Well, first of all, one thing is really important to do is think about who your audience is, right? So you try to write, and the general tip is try to write for as broad an audience as possible. Now, that doesn't mean you're, you're trying to dumb down your research, but really the idea is you have a particular journal in which you are submitting your article, right? The journal Nature or perhaps Physical Review Letters or a specific uh, journal. There's a scientific audience, right, in that that among that audience, what you're trying to do is you want to try to place or describe in the title your work in a way which it conveys it very clearly uh, to the broadest possible audience in that 
in that venue in which you are presenting your paper. Okay, so what are some ways to do that? First and foremost, I'll skip down here, is really avoid jargon, right? Avoid acronyms. You know, if you, we had a discussion this morning about different ways of doing uh, particles and finding particles and tracking particles. A common acronym that was used, PIV, which Mark defined. But if your article describes that and you have an audience that you know, may know what PIV is, particle image velocimetry, but you have a broader audience, say you're trying to write this article for nature, then probably if it's key, then you should describe that and put that in the title, but it should be explained. So almost always avoid use of acronyms uh, because they are basically the, the language of uh, specialists, right? So you try to, uh, the, the, to the extent possible, do that and avoid specialized terms because every time you put in a term which uh, uh, is not known widely, you narrow the audience, you give the reader a reason to stop reading your paper, okay? And the other thing is uh, in the title, be succinct, right? Sometimes you see these very long titles you read through and by the time you finish you say, I, I don't have any idea what this paper's about, I'm gonna stop reading it there, put people to sleep and just reading the title. So you wanna be succinct, try to be short and snappy with your title. Again, um, a key uh, uh, take home lesson in all of this is write and rewrite and rewrite. Take your paper, even elements of your paper, and show it to your colleagues and you know, circulate these the, as you write to get feedback. And the more feedback you get, the better you can hone all aspects of your paper. So, um, but sh being short and succinct is really uh, an important, uh, important step, particularly for the title. Now, Imagine that the reader is going through your paper, or imagine you are the reader and you're going through someone else's paper. Question for you, what, in what order do you read the paper? Okay. So the topics here, sort of the structure of the paper is more or less, I would say, listed in sequential form here, right? There's the title, there's abstract, the introduction, the background, methods, results, discussion, conclusions, right? That's sort of the sequence. Uh, figures are throughout, uh, references at the end. But think about when you are going through and reading a paper, what are the first, you know, let's say maybe you counter the title, what are the first few of this list, let's say, what are the first one, two, or three things that you actually look at when you're, you are in the process of looking at paper? So take a moment to think about that. Okay, you want to go ahead and give a... Uh, abstract and conclusion. Okay, so we have, well, tell me your name. Junius. Yes. So Junius does abstract, right, title abstract, then ju jumps to the conclusions. That's an interesting sequence. Notice, not in the, not in the sequence laid out here. Anybody else have a, some, a, perhaps a, the same or different? Abstract, abstract, and then you go to the results. Okay. Anybody else? Abstract, methods, conclusions. I only look at the pictures. Look at the pictures. Okay, title, go to the figures. <laughs> abstract and what? Figures. Abstract and figures. Title, figures, and it's okay, conclusion. Okay, okay. What, what's the point here? Okay, now when we're writing the paper, we may have in our mind, right, so you are acting as readers, reading somebody else's paper. Think about what you have in mind when you're writing your paper. Perhaps you have in mind, and a lot of, of writers have this in mind, is that they think that, th that the reader is going to start with a title and work their way all the way through. And, well, if they, let's say, they go from the abstract to the conclusions, well, in the conclusions, you've defined a bunch of terms, right? But that's okay because they started with the beginning and they, those terms were defined earlier in the paper and you're going to assume that when they get to the conclusions, they've already understood the terms you've defined earlier in the paper. That's going to fail, right? It's gonna fail because different people 
uh, get, have different ways of reading the paper. The punchline is, other readers are like you. They skip around, right? So a paper that's meant to be read sequentially, start from the top, go through the end, won't make sense to a lot of people. And what is that going to do? It's going to cause people to stop reading. Right? So this is something you want to avoid doing. Well, how do you avoid that, right? What do you, you know, you can't control how people work through that. Well, one sort of very general tip is to try to make each major element as self-contained as possible. Now, it's not going to be possible that you're going to get the entire paper, let's say, in the abstract, or the entire paper in the figures. But if you have in mind that other people are going to read the way you read, then if you try to the extent possible in each of these, particularly these main elements, like the abstracts or the figures, we heard a number of people say, after title, I do abstract. After title, I do figures. If you think about trying to tell the story, and I'll say something about that. When you're writing your paper, it's all about storytelling, right? We as humans tell stories. We as scientists who are humans tell stories. It's all about trying to tell your story in as effective a manner as possible, okay? So one key to doing that is try to build that story to the extent possible in these elements which people will access first because if they read that part they get to the abstract you've told that in an effective way and got the main point across they'll want to keep reading in general that helps increase the odds that they will continue to delve more deeply into your paper okay so that's a really key fundamental idea here. So let's talk about that in the context of the abstract. What should it contain? So this is one of the main things that uh, the, the sessions that we're going to go over this afternoon in, in communication, and that is in the writing session, the focus will be on writing an abstract. Now it's going to be the abstract for your poster, but the same ideas apply, right? The same sort of guidelines. So what is the length? You have to keep it short. Those typically in journals, they will tell you what your length limitations are. But really, you want to keep it short, doing a poster. But it should have very key elements, OK? So what is the problem you're studying, right? You should state that very clearly up front. What's the key idea, OK? Why should the reader care, right? Why should they care about that problem you spent five years working on? Right? You want to communicate that. What did you do? What was your take? S experiments, simulations. What is the particular angle that you angle of attack that you had on the particular problem? Okay. Really importantly, okay, what's new? What did you bring to this scientific discipline? That problem. What did you uh, What did you find in that case? And why is it? what you found, why is it interesting? Once again, why is the problem interesting and why is what you accomplished or found or uh, discovered uh, interesting? So you make sure you want to communicate that. And then what does it all mean, okay? What does it mean going backwards in the past? How does it tie to what has happened before? How does it build on or perhaps correct what has come before? Okay, and what, what does it mean going forward? This result implies these are directions to go. Okay, it's a lot to do, but these are the kinds of ideas you should have in mind. That encapsulates the main story. This really will help keep people reading, right, if you, if you try to embody in your abstract these really important points. Yes? Um, um, I, I don't want to jump into the... Yes. Okay, so as I was saying before, you can't assume that people are going to, so you have in mind, I don't want to put in the abstract, I'll talk about it in the conclusions. They may never read your conclusions. You heard people read, first they're going to read the you know, title, then perhaps the abstracts, maybe the figures. That's why you try to make these major elements, particularly the ones that come first in many people's minds, try to make them as self-contained as possible to communicate the main message. You might think, well, I'll just repeat myself in the conclusions. 
it won't hurt. Okay, so this is another, you spent five years on this problem, right? And you think if I say it more than once to someone else who has never heard it before, they will be bored. Quite the opposite. You need to say it many, many times to somebody who has never heard your story before so that they can begin to understand it. Okay, so don't feel afraid about repeating yourself. In fact, you should, in a, in a, in a again, artful way, communicate that main message in these other elements. Now again, each of these, sub, these components of a paper can't communicate the whole message, but the idea is these first main points or these main elements play a huge role in determining whether readers are going to continue delving more deeply. So you want to help them do that not throw up barriers to that. Okay, so it's a very good question. Okay. Let's talk about figures. Um, so, I learned from Harry that even before you start writing a paper, you have a story to tell, where do you start telling that story? You start with the figures. And so basically, you decide what those figures are going to be. And in fact, uh, many of us who have worked with him, <laughs> Matthias is nodding his head, <laughs> you go over and over and over until those figures and captions tell the story. Because that's another key piece, okay? So, um, again, the to totality of all figures you try to tell the whole story of the paper. Within each figure, there's a chapter of the story. You try to make it as self-contained as possible. Do not require the reader to jump to your text to then understand what's going on in the figure, right? Because that's another way to give them a reason to stop reading, okay? So you try to make this a self-contained story. If they're difficult to understand, they will move on to somebody else's paper. Okay? Now, here's a key thing. Figures ideally communicate a message even without you needing a caption. Do we need a caption for understanding what's going on in this uh, figure? You know, our brains work, as Mark was saying, our brains are tremendous at doing image processing and actually interpreting meaning from images. They've had millions upon millions of years of, of practicing that or survival, depending on looking at images and, and making meaning from those images, right? So we should take advantage of that. Figures build on that. And so you really try to design your figures so that the figures themselves can convey a message because there's a lot there that can, the brain can process if the figures are crafted in a way to communicate that effectively. Okay, so that's a key key uh, point to remember. Now, there's a famous uh, book which is the, titled The Visual Display of Quantitative Information by a man named Edward Tufte. This guy makes his living going around and telling everyone how to create effective figures. And I have to say, he's very good at it. This book, which has been around for decades, is really excellent, right? And there are some, this doesn't encapsulate all the main ideas, and we're going to go through some. He has a number of case studies which are really useful to go through. But here are some principles you can garner from that. When you create a figure, make sure you maximize the ratio of the data ink to all the other ink, right? And so we'll look at some examples and see what that means. But um, I think of this really more in the context of this doesn't apply just to papers. Let's say they also applies to uh, PowerPoint presentations. How many times do you see people take and have all sorts of fancy decorations and such on the slides and then you know all sorts of font colors and different colors? That's gratuitous use of graphics, ink, you know, digital ink, which do, does not contribute to communicating the information. So you notice these slides from Harry Swinney, his philosophy, very simple background, and here is the ink you need to communicate the message. So this general principle 
ma maximize ratio of data ink to other ink is a universal. It applies to posters. If you're in my poster session, I'm going to be hard on gratuitous use of color because I find it and I think others will f may find it just distracting. You want the ink that is there to be focused on communicating the information you want to get across. Okay. Again, there are there is an artistic component. Different people differ on this philosophy, but this is a, a principle that you'd be well advised to have in mind for all sorts of, of visual communication. Now, when you have graphs, you try to make those as simple as possible. That sort of is part of this. But in some sense, one example would be don't overload your graphs with information. Right? Don't put 12 curves on with dot dash and dash and blue and green and red. Right? You should think very carefully about the amount of information you need so that it will convey the main point as effectively in as simple a manner as possible. Okay? And here's one that he's big on and that is don't use legends. Right? Don't force your reader to look at the small box in your figure with the 12 symbols to then go back to see which where that symbol is and back and forth. Instead, if you have different curves that mean something differently, label the curves themselves. Okay? So you don't need to force the, the, the reader to jump back and forth. Again, all these things are in service of trying to keep the reader from having an excuse to stop. Okay? So let's look at um, uh, a couple of examples. All right. From a paper of Linus Pauling, double Nobel Prize winner. <laughs> right? Lots of problems with this graph. Okay? Question is, how can this graph be improved? So what I want you to do is think about it for just a few, uh, just a few seconds. Dot sh before we start, just be just, uh, just a minute. So we're gonna we're practicing something of which is called active learning, and it will be peer instruction. And we'll say more about that in science education next week. So I want you to in individually think about in your own mind what are ways in which you would improve this. So let's take like 30 seconds or so. How many different ways can you improve this graph? Okay, now what I want you to do is turn to your neighbor, talk to your neighbor, and share, and see if you have the same ideas, or maybe come up with new ideas. How do we improve this? There are at least, you know, six or seven or eight ways this could be improved. You had a chance to discuss. Okay, uh, I will mention, incidentally, when you use this kind of method in your lectures, 
to pose questions to your, your students that you're lecturing to. This is very effective. You see the activity because then you start talking and getting involved. This is an example of active learning. So this is a really important thing. We'll talk more about that next week in science education. Okay, let's have some, uh, some, someone volunteer, some number of people volunteer. How can you improve this graph? Let's, each, uh, let's say someone raise their hand and uh, name a way this could be improved. <laughs> no improvements. <laughs> okay. Yes. We discussed that the crosses are unnecessary. Okay. What the heck are these crosses doing there? I mean, that is gratuitous ink, right? That is not data ink. That's other ink. Get rid of them. Okay. It's a good point. Another, another suggestion. Okay, it is true that perhaps color would work here, maybe not in 1947, but, uh, but uh, perhaps one could use color to make this more effective. Other suggestions? Yes? Sorry? Uh, missing a legend. <laughs> Why does it need a legend? But I think what you're driving at is, what the heck are these curves? You know, why are those curves like that? What is, what's the meaning? There's something that you don't understand about, uh, there's this line, uh, broke, and then there's another one. What's going on here? So it's true, there's something about those curves which, you know, at, you're trying to like, why are they drawn that way, right? Uh, we'll talk about maybe some of us can figure out what this is and you'll see it very clearly, but th that needs to be explicated. There is information that your eye is drawn to and you have no clue what it means and you're, you're going to be frustrated by that. Uh, let's choose somebody else. Another suggestion. I, I yes? Think he's, he's making these dotted lines to show some kind of best fit, but it doesn't explain anything. That's right. That's right. So to do ex more explanation about that. Someone else. So we have only, we had a lot of discussion. Session leaders can chime in too. Yes? Sorry? Uh, the label of y axis is not at the middle of the. Uh, okay. Yeah. So the label, okay. Uh, so there's one thing, it could be elevated. I'll tell you a, a problem I have with this. Why not rotate that? Atomic volume, right? Why not rotate it? Now, again, sometimes you can't do it. Space limitations. There's space to do that. Rotate it so you can read it. Bruce. Uh, rotate the labels, the same thing on the vertical axis, yeah. right? Yeah. What else? Yes. No oh, go ahead, and then I'll take you. Yes. No Where are the units? <laughs> what does this mean? Atomic volume in what units? If you're a chemist, you might know, right? <laughs> we know this has something to do with like the periodic table or something, but you know, what's atomic volume? Maybe I had it in chemistry, freshman chemistry 30 years ago, no idea what the units are. Yes? Sorry? Uh, title, perhaps, yes. Uh, yeah, it doesn't have a caption. Okay, well you can see there are lots of things. Let's look at what Tufty, um, kind of suggestions Tufty made. Okay, so a lot of them, what you said was actually, have been incorporated. Um, Identifying what these curves are. So what you see here, actually, these are the alkaline metals, right? And then now with that in there, you start to say, okay, atomic number, ah, maybe what this curve means is that you are in a particular, okay, well, I forgot, this is group or is this group? Remind me, it's this, this particular, the horizontal part of the, the, uh, the uh, periodic table. Chemist back here. The rows, okay, the rows. This is an official chemist called the rows. These are the rows on the periodic table, right? And then you add, when you add an, a, this, uh, a shell, right? You, you have this, this jump in the volume. Okay, so that, now, even without having labeled that with the different, uh, the row number, um, shell number, basically you can see that from this alkaline metal. So that gives you more information. A couple of other things. So uh, this is the issue of, of rotating the label. Notice these labels not just only rotated, but fewer of them. You don't need all these labels for the axis, right? We can, we can determine between 20 and 40 is 30, right? Reduce that amount of ink. Um, another thing that Tufty's big, big on is eliminating these boxes. He doesn't like this uh, kind of thing where you're doing the top and the side. You know, that's sort of a matter of taste. 
um, I think. Uh, no units here. Tufty missed that one, right? Should have units. Okay, so these are things, again, thinking about when you're communicating, making your plots tell a story and do that in a more effective way. Let's look at another case study. This is, a, in Tufty's view, like the worst graph ever, <laughs> right? This is, let's take a look at that thing. What the heck is it about? <laughs> Just look at that for a second. That is quite a uh, monstrosity. Okay, even the title, Age Structure of College Enrollment. I mean, how obscure <laughs> jargony can you be? Okay, so you know what? There are five data points here. They're plotting five data points. <laughs> okay, let's, let's look at what Tufty has to say about what are, what's bad about this graph. There are five data points. We'll show what, what those are. So what this is showing is basically, uh, you know, the um, percent of college students over a certain, let's say, let's say 25 and over for a few years five for five consecutive years. That's what it's showing, okay? So why, why do you need the 3D business, right? Why do you need the color? Again, this is like way, doesn't do anything. This is the same information as that. 100 minus this produces that, you know, this percentage. Can't read the fonts. Uh, what the heck are these curves? All these curves connecting to points, why? Why is it curved? Um, what's the reason for the break here, right? This is just like really uh, a bizarre thing. So let's look at how can you communicate this? You could put the five points in a table or you could plot them, <laughs> right? Okay, so this is the, so you get the message, right? Figures are really important. You want to make it, your eye really is very effective at, you know, grabbing and getting and obtaining a lot of information all at once communicating a message, but you have to design the visual so it does that. It doesn't get in the way of the readers getting the message, okay? So figures, tell a story. Okay, what else? Let's talk about the writing aspect. So, you know, brains have been developed for many, many years for uh, image processing, but in, sort of interpreting symbols in the form of writing has not been around that long, right? A few thousand years. And in fact, most of the world didn't know how to interpret symbols in terms of writing until, you know, relatively recently, 100, 200 years ago, right? 10% of the world's population was literate in, as, at around 1850. So I certainly, that my, my family back less than six generations was, was illiterate. They came from, they were peasants in the uh, Russian steppe, and, or I should say in the Ukrainian steppe. They were farmers, right? I'm sure they were not literate back in the late 1800s. So this is very recent. What does that mean? That basically it takes more for your brain to process, uh, to interpret the writing. So you have to really be um, careful about crafting the words to communicate clearly. Now, what are some really key things to get across? So, so we talked about so those first major elements, abstract figures. Some things that should really make sure you put in uh, the paper uh, to make it scientific. The key thing, I would say punchline, is that you make sure you put enough information in there so that someone else wants to replicate the results, they can do it. So if they're going to do the experiment, okay? In order to do that, they're gonna to have to dig more deeply but make sure that if someone chooses to do that, that information is there, okay? You know, parameter values for your experiments and ranges, units, right? Um, if there's sample preparation, try to describe that in as much detail that enables replication. Simulations, boundary conditions, initial conditions, right? Um, Theoretical analysis. So these are the key things. If, it, if it's not enough information to do replication, it's not really 
Uh, it, 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 so you can write short letters. That's difficult to do, but at least it should, you know, a short paper should point to a larger page paper ultimately that in which this can, um, this information can be found. Now, references. Okay, it is. It's our civic duty to give. Uh, do where it is due to give, acknowledge uh, prior work when you're building on the work of others. Um, if you may not, you may have a personal something personal against someone else who is working your field. They scooped you, or they, they treated you badly, perhaps, and you sort of have it in for them. That is not a reason for omitting them from your reference list, right? So make sure it's an eth it's an ethical. Uh, you, you're ethically bound as a scientist to really cite the work that that you built on when you. Um, communicated or you you were doing your science. So it's really important. There's a, uh, a nice policy statement about this in, in, in detail at the American Physical Society that's uh, worth reading. Okay, so we're gonna wrap up here. What's the most important thing to have in mind? You rewrite and rewrite and rewrite, okay? So I mentioned that, starting with that idea of the process of, let's say, a title and figures, and you go over those over and over and over again, right? Get others to look at those early stages, you know, give feedback. You may not like what they say, but actually you should, it, 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 you know, it hurts when people are saying that this looks really horrible, but it's really valuable. You should value that kind of feedback because it helps you make it get better. Right? So if someone who spends the time to give you uh, a critique that is sharp but is on point and you may not feel good but it will help your science just get better. Um, uh, read it out loud to others, uh, to another person to see if it sounds good and cut out un unessential material. Yes, Ken. Yeah. And then uh, just keep doing it until you read it and it actually you're not saying that anymore. It actually reads pretty well. Yeah. Yeah, that's good that's good advice. All right. Yes, and then uh, you know, edit, try to make it succinct, cut out uh, unnecessary material. Again, the, the the mantra that I have always in mind is I don't want to give the reader an excuse to stop reading. The person who's reading it will have plenty of excuses to stop reading. All right? Don't give them extra excuses. So that's, a, I think, a good punchline to have in mind. So it is a really important part of doing science, right? communicating your science. And in fact, the very process of writing your work up actually is, you might think, well, I'm communicating, not doing science. Actually, when you are writing, it is a, uh, excellent opportunity to sort of rethink very deeply about the work you've done and you'll find out many times you will make changes that are you know oh this doesn't sound right I've missed something that impacts your scientific research so it's in fact an opportunity to really think deeply about the science you've done and actually learn some new insights um, many times often is not okay so those are the sort of tips. Again, there are tips that are uh, put together by a master, Harry Swinney. I am just the messenger, so I communicate those on to you. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you for your attention. Any questions or comments or anything? We